Hi everyone, and welcome back to a supplementary video for the New Testament Survey course. This is technically a supplement to our survey of Paul's epistle to the Romans, but it really covers the teaching of the entire New Testament on this particular topic. In this section, we'll look in more depth at the word pictures the New Testament writers used to describe and teach about the salvation which Jesus accomplished for us. We already briefly looked at a few of these in the previous supplementary section on Romans chapter 3, and in this section we'll expand on that discussion as well as cover many additional ideas and concepts. There are a number of these word pictures used throughout the New Testament because Christian salvation is multifaceted, and just one metaphor could not cover the fullness of what Christ has done on our behalf and how that affects us. Now, just to be clear, even though I'm calling these metaphors and symbols and word pictures, which they are, this in no way means that the reality they describe is not completely genuine and true and effective in our lives. We are not dealing with fiction or fairy tale here. We're dealing with historical reality that changes real lives in the real world by something that God did through Christ on a real cross in real history. But the truth is so wonderful and complex that the Bible resorts to metaphors, pictures, and symbols to try to describe and explain all the facets of what took place on the cross and how that impacts the lives of Christians when they believe. There are a few consistent groups of terms and ideas that are used throughout the New Testament to describe salvation. They are separate but related ideas that all give part of the entire truth about salvation. They should not be confused with each other, but neither should they be separated, because all of these ideas together give the whole truth about what God has done and is doing in the lives of his people. I'll try to explain these terms in detail, because they're key to understanding the truth of our salvation. But I'm grouping all these terms together under the title of Salvation Word Pictures because these words all had prior meaning and connotations which came from their common experience and knowledge of their culture. The New Testament authors used these words in order to teach and illustrate something about what God had done in saving his people. And so, a bit of background of the meaning of these terms is helpful for understanding salvation. Now, for each of these word pictures, I'll try to describe the historical background and phenomenon from that culture in order to understand how the New Testament writers used and applied these common experiences to explain what Christ accomplished. And each of these word pictures and their application to Christ contains a mini story. Each metaphor has kind of a built-in narrative, which includes a previous state before the key event happens, then the key event of the word picture, and then the resulting state that happened as a direct result of that key event. And when these word pictures were applied to describing Christian salvation, they carried with them that same structure. Something was true about our life before salvation, then Christ happened, Christ did something on the cross that addressed our prior state, and then, as that salvation is applied to our life, we're now characterized by a new state which is radically different from before. So each of these word pictures has an inherent story of before, the event itself, and after. And the New Testament writers applied this word picture to describe our salvation in terms of before Christ, what Christ did, and after Christ. So the key questions inherent in each of these word pictures is, what changed? How is life after different from life before? And what did Christ do to make that change? How did the cross and resurrection of Christ bring about this difference? So, watch for each of these stages in each of the word pictures as we work through, and ask what that tells you about your own life and the change that Christ has brought. But also watch for what this tells us about the big picture, the entire Bible story of what God was doing in Christ to fix the universal problems caused by sin and to restore all of creation better than it ever was before. In other words, 
These word pictures tell us the before and after change in our individual lives, but they also point to God's overall purpose in Christ to recreate a people for himself prepared for the new heavens and the new earth in his new kingdom. Now, as we saw in an earlier section on the social background of the New Testament, there was a variety of influences on life in the New Testament times, and likewise, these word pictures come from a combination of influences, and I want to highlight the two primary ones. First is the background of Old Testament religion and custom, especially the Old Testament sacrificial system. And second is the Greek language used in writing in the New Testament. And that includes the ideas inherent in the Greek words themselves that had a background in Greek culture, which was partly shared by the New Testament people. And I'll try to bring all of that together as we look at each individual word picture. So let's begin to look at them one at a time. The first word picture I want to examine is justification, which is related to the word justified and just, but also to the words translated righteous and righteousness. These are all different forms of the same root word in the language of the New Testament. Justification basically means to make righteous or to declare righteous, and justified means made or acknowledged to be righteous. Now, all of these terms, in the language and culture in which Paul wrote, they came primarily from the legal sphere. They're words from a courtroom and legal proceedings. They all mean to be in conformity with some objective standard. Primarily in the legal sphere, that means to be on the right side of the law. A moral person would be called a righteous man because he upheld what the standards required. Let me give you an example. If I would get a parking ticket and I went to court, the judge could rule that it actually was legal to park there. And so I would be justified before the law, that is, declared and certified to be righteous as far as the parking law is concerned. However, the judge could declare that I was guilty and sentence me to pay a fine. In that case, after I paid that fine, the judge would then declare and certify that I was now in right standing with the law, or once again justified and considered righteous concerning that infraction because the penalty had been paid and it was no longer hanging over me. In the New Testament, this legal language is applied to our relationship to God, that is, to be on the right side of his character as shown in his revealed standards of right and wrong. So sometimes this word group means that someone is innocent and upright. They've done what is right as in the case when it says that God is righteous. Sometimes this word word group refers to God's activity of rendering judgment. And in those cases, when someone is innocent of a particular transgression, he declares them just. In most of the key passages about salvation, this word refers to declaring and certifying that someone is now in right standing because the penalty has been paid. Justified, justification, righteous, and righteousness in that day all had the idea of a legal setting and being on the right side of justice. And so, it meant to be in right standing with God in terms of guilt or innocence with regard to his standards of right and wrong. Now, some people object that what the Bible says goes beyond a mere law court, and in some ways, God is not the same as a court judge. Well, like any analogy, it can be pushed too far into nonsense, and we should not push this analogy any farther than the New Testament writers push it. But even though justification language in the New Testament means more than a legal setting, it never means less than a legal setting. And we should never strip this concept of the legal connotations of being declared and having a certified standing on the right side of God's legal authority. Now, let's look at a few examples of this in the New Testament. And for time's sake, I'm going to have to limit to just a few verses for each word picture. 
but I'll list more for you to explore on your own time. Romans chapter 3, verses 20 through 24 says, For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there's no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now, we looked at this passage in the last supplementary section, and it shows that God, by grace, gives His people the status of righteousness because Christ has paid the penalty of sin, which is received by faith. Then in Galatians chapter 2, verses 15 through 16, it says, We know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law, because by observing the law, no one will be justified. Now, this passage shows a regular stress about justification, especially by Paul, that our justification is not the kind where we're pronounced innocent because we've kept the law. No, that definition does not apply to us because we've all sinned. Rather, our justification is the kind where we are pronounced to be no longer liable because of Christ having paid our penalty which we receive through faith. And I have listed a few other key passages that use this word picture to describe our salvation, and I encourage you to work through them as you have the time. So now let's summarize the word picture of justification in terms of its before and after contrast. Before justification, we were under genuine threat of the penalty for our guilt, which the Bible describes as eternal death and the wrath of God. But Christ came and paid that legal penalty on our behalf. He experienced death and the wrath of God as our substitute on the cross. Therefore, the penalty of our sin has already been paid. And so, for those who are in Christ by faith, we are declared and certified to no longer be liable to that punishment. We are no longer under condemnation of the law. We are free from the threat of eternal death and the wrath of God. We are now in right legal standing with the law of God and free from the threat of punishment and any legal restrictions based on our guilt. We have been changed from the status of guilt under punishment to the status of considered righteous with upright standing before God. And then the next word picture is the idea of redemption and being redeemed. Just like justification language came from a law court, redemption language came from a slave market. In that day, if someone fell on hard times and was overwhelmed with serious debt, there was no such thing as bankruptcy protection, and so the person would sell themselves or be sold into slavery until they could pay off their debt through their labor. Or someone would be captured in battle and be held for ransom or sold into slavery. However, if they had a friend or relative with the means to do so, that person could pay the price of their debt or ransom and so buy back their freedom from slavery to their captors. So the word redeem meant to buy back by paying some appropriate ransom price. And the word redemption means either the ransom price paid to buy them back, or the whole process of buying back by paying a ransom price. This literal buying someone back from slavery or captivity was applied by the New Testament writers to the concept of Christ paying a price to rescue us out of what kept us captive. In the New Testament, people are described as being slaves to sin and to the elemental principles of this world. And Christ gave his life as a ransom for many, and provided redemption for his people. Now, in a similar way, this analogy can be pushed too far by conjecture about paying off the devil or other details 
that the New Testament does not claim, but these words do communicate the idea of paying some sort of ransom price to rescue someone else and purchase their freedom. Now, here are a few examples of this idea in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 20, verse 28 says, The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus specifically said that his life was given as a ransom, which is from the same word group we're looking at. And this ransom was on behalf of many, with the connotation that this somehow procured their freedom. And this is made even more explicit in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, which says, In Christ we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace. Now, this passage says that our redemption is through his blood, that is, through his death. And this is connected with the forgiveness of sins. His death somehow paid the price to free us from the consequences of our sin. And this happened because of the riches of God's grace. And in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18-19, through 19, it says, For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. This passage says, We were redeemed from our former empty way of life, and this was not through monetary payment, but by the payment price of the blood of Christ, who is described as a sacrificial lamb, like in the Old Testament. And there are many more that I have listed for you to explore further. Let me try to summarize the concept of redemption by contrasting the before and after. Before our redemption, we were captive to sin and in debt to our guilt. We were captured by the mindset and ways of this fallen world with no way to get out on our own. But Christ, by his death, paid a ransom price to rescue us from what held us captive. And therefore, he brought forgiveness for all our sins. By Christ's payment, our debt has been erased and we have been released from captivity. We truly have been set free from all the things that held us captive because Christ paid the price. We've been changed from slaves and debtors to be forgiven and free. Our past sin and guilt no longer hang over us, and those things that once controlled us have lost their grip. We are free, not to serve sin or our own selfish plans, but free to serve Christ and His righteousness. Then the next word picture is propitiation which is sometimes translated sacrifice of atonement. The idea of propitiation comes from the context of a temple altar. Now, in that day, everyone was familiar with sacrifice at a temple. The Jews still made sacrifices to God in the temple at Jerusalem, and the Greeks and Romans had many gods and many temples to their gods. And in all of these temples, they offered sacrifices with the same general purpose to appease their gods and somehow make atonement or propitiation. The idea was that, for some reason, their god was displeased with them and was acting against them with disfavor and even wrath. But the people would go to the temple and offer a sacrifice, and that sacrifice would somehow turn aside the wrath and influence the god to change from disfavor to being favorable towards the person who offered the sacrifice. And in the Bible, this is related to the concept of atonement. The word atonement, which occurs many times throughout the Old Testament, means to cover something, specifically to cover guilt and sin. The Old Testament sacrifices were said to make atonement, to cover over, that is, to somehow hide the stain and offensiveness of sin and guilt so that God would no longer take account of that sin and be angry with his people. This was the idea behind the Day of Atonement sacrifice and much of the temple sacrificial system in the Old Testament. So the basic idea of propitiation is that somehow 
by a sacrificial offering, God's wrath is turned aside, and he is made favorable towards someone. So, a propitiation, or sacrifice of atonement, is the activity that causes God to be favorable instead of displeased. In the New Testament passages that speak of propitiation, it refers to the activity of Christ making a sacrifice that turns away God's wrath, making him once again benevolent towards his people. Now, it might seem like a paradox, but it's true that the same God who is wrathful towards us because of our sin was loving towards us in providing the propitiation that turned away his own wrath. You see, our God is big enough to be rightfully angry with sin and still be loving towards sinners, to have perfect justice and perfect love in the same great God. And there are only a few examples of this word in the New Testament, but they're key passages. You might remember in the previous section, we examined Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 26, which in verse 25 says, God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. Christ was sacrificed as a propitiation, the means by which God's wrath was satisfied and turned away so that his people would experience redemption and justification. And Hebrews chapter 2 verse 17 says, Therefore, Christ had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Now this passage talks about the purpose for Jesus coming, to be our great high priest, and the ultimate purpose of that is that he would make atonement, or propitiation, for the sins of the people. And this is a direct reference to the Old Testament sacrifices, especially the Day of Atonement, that covered and took away the sins of the people and made them right with God. Jesus did that for his people in a way that the Old Testament sacrifices never fully could. And then finally, is 1 John chapter 4, verse 10, which says, This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. In this verse, John described the supreme demonstration of the love of God, and that is that he sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now, notice that in these verses, our sins are mentioned in relation to propitiation, and that makes sense, because the meaning of propitiation is to take away the wrath of God, which is the result of our sin and guilt. So, to summarize the word picture of propitiation by contrasting before and after, before propitiation, God was offended by our sin and guilt, and therefore we were under the wrath and displeasure of God. But Christ made a sacrifice of himself on the cross in order to make atonement for our sins. And so, God was propitiated by this sacrifice on our behalf. And as a result, we are no longer under the wrath of God for our sins. Rather, we can now enjoy his favor and blessings. We are changed from wrath to favor with God because the cause of his wrath has been covered by the propitiation which Christ accomplished. Next is the idea of reconciliation, which means something very similar in our culture as it did in the culture of the New Testament. This is a word picture from interpersonal relationships, where the cause of enmity is dealt with and a broken relationship is restored. The idea of reconciliation includes four basic ideas. First, there was a relationship that was more or less good. Second, that something happened to strain or break that relationship. You know, something was done, something was said, that offended one of the parties so that they no longer wanted to be in relationship. And therefore, there was at least coldness and indifference to the other person, and probably even enmity and hatred. Then third, 
Something was done to take away the cause of offense. Someone apologized. They took back what they said, or they paid back the money they stole, or somehow tried to fix whatever they had done that broke the relationship. And so finally, the relationship was restored back to what it had been before. So reconciliation comes from the idea of a changed relationship, and it means the restoring of a broken relationship by somehow dealing with the cause of enmity, which damaged the formerly good relationship. It is the change from enmity to peace and friendship. And in the New Testament, this concept refers to the relationship between God and His people, which was broken by our sin and rebellion. And what stands out as different in the New Testament is that we, as the offending party, we were not the ones who took the step to restore the relationship. God has taken the initiative, while we were still sinners, to send Christ to take away the cause of our offense against Him by making propitiation and so securing our redemption and justification. Christ has taken away the offense of our sin and guilt so that God no longer has a cause to be offended and at enmity against us. Without the removal of the cause of enmity, the relationship could not have truly been restored. And at the cross, our sin and guilt is not just ignored or glossed over, but actually dealt with and destroyed. Christ has truly taken away the sin and guilt that had made us offensive to God, and so the relationship is restored. Here are a few passages that talk about reconciliation. Romans chapter 5, verses 10 and 11 says, For if, when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his Son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. This passage says that we were God's enemies, but we were reconciled to Him by the death of Christ. And because we are now in restored relationship with Him, we have all the benefits of His salvation and relationship, in which we rejoice. And in that context, the resulting benefits that Paul mentioned are peace with God, access to His grace, the hope of the glory of God, among others. We are saved from God's wrath and saved through his life. And Colossians chapter 1, verses 19 through 22 says, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you wholly in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. In this passage, Paul stated that God was reconciling all things to himself, and the way he was doing this was by making peace through Christ's blood on the cross. And he also applied this specifically to his people. We all were alienated from God because of our evil behavior, being enemies of God. But we were reconciled by Christ's death, so that now we are holy, without blemish and any reason for accusation. That is, Christ took away the cause of our accusation and enmity at the cross by his death. And now we have peace with God. And not only that, but because in the, in the larger biblical story, the sin which humanity brought into the world caused the breaking of all creation, so now the reconciliation which Christ brought about will also be applied to fix all of creation. Reconciliation is equated with making peace in all these areas. And I've listed a few other verses for you to check out. The first two also describe our relationship with God. And the others all describe reconciliation between people, which can help us understand the verses that describe our reconciliation with God.
Now, let me summarize by contrasting the before and after. In one sense, the concept of reconciliation is an umbrella idea that includes the idea of justification, redemption, and propitiation. Before, we were created for relationship with God, but that was broken by sin. And now, all of humanity stands under the righteous wrath and enmity of God. And we also hate and run away from God because of our guilt and fear of his just wrath. But Christ took the initiative and he made peace with God. He dealt with the cause of our enmity by dying on the cross, shedding his blood to take away our sin and guilt, so that now we can live in a restored relationship with him by believing in Christ. In Christ, our relationship with God, with one another, and with creation is restored. He has brought peace with God and sends out the message of reconciliation through the proclamation of the gospel. Our lives are changed from enmity to peace. The relationship we were created for is now restored. The next is the idea of regeneration, or new birth. This is the idea included in the phrase, born again. Now, this is obviously a word picture from a maternity ward, that is, from childbirth. A new life comes into the world when a child is born. Now, just to be clear, the Bible includes conception and gestation in the process of birth. Life begins at conception, but this word picture speaks in the normal convention of giving birth. In the birth process, a new life happens, which did not exist before. The biblical picture of regeneration uses either this process of birth or sometimes the resurrection from the dead to speak of new life happening where there once was the absence of life. This new life comes into being by some sort of spiritual birth. God does something in salvation to create a new life that did not exist before. Even though people had physical life, before regeneration, they were spiritually dead. And God did something to give them spiritual life and take away the sentence of death which hung over every one of us. This is the new life of the next age, the resurrection life of the new heavens and the new earth, which Jesus now has and which he gives to his people through the new birth. The new birth is miraculous. It is a different kind of life than the life that all humans already experience. And Jesus clearly stated that without this miraculous new birth, no one will experience the kingdom of God. And the key text that talks about this is John chapter 3, verses 1 through 21. I've already done a separate section on just that passage, so you can check it out for more details. But in that chapter, Jesus told Nicodemus that the new birth from above was an absolute necessity if someone were to experience the kingdom. And Jesus clarified that it was a miracle done by God's Spirit as predicted in the Old Testament. We cannot fully understand it, but we see its effects in the new life which a person displays. And it comes by believing in Jesus, whom God sent to bring this eternal life. And we see this also in 1 Peter chapter 1. Verse 3 says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And verse 23 says, For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. In each of these verses, Peter told his readers that they had been given the new birth, or born again. This birth happened through the Word of God because of the resurrection of Christ, and it came from the mercy and grace of God, and resulted in a living hope, which is the life of the next age kept in heaven for us. And there are other New Testament verses that talk about new birth and being born from God and I've listed them for you to follow up at your convenience.
Now, to summarize the before and after, before the new birth, we were dead in sins, having no spiritual life. We had no ability to give ourselves life any more than we could have caused our own natural conception and birth. But through the miracle of new birth, God in Christ gave us new life, where once there was only death. And so now we participate in the resurrection life of Christ, which is the life of the next age. We have changed from no spiritual life and the punishment of eternal death into the newness of life in this age and eternal life forevermore, sharing in this new life from God. And there's also the word picture of adoption, which is commonly understood in our time as well. However, there are some significant differences between adoption in our day and adoption in New Testament times. Now, this is a word picture from family life, where someone who formerly was not a part of the family is purposely brought into the family with all the rights, privileges, and responsibilities of being a family member. It is a change of legal status, now legally being part of the family, but it's also a change of relational status, considered by the family to be one of their own. Now, in our day, we think of adoption primarily in regard to younger children who have been orphaned or given up for adoption. And the primary purpose in our day for adoption is to make sure that these children are taken care of and raised in a secure and loving environment that sadly is often lacking in orphanages or foster care. But in the New Testament times, when a young child was orphaned, they were usually taken care of by their extended family members or somebody in their community, but they're not typically adopted. Adoption, especially in the Greco-Roman culture, was usually for a different reason. Adoption in that day was typically done primarily for the purpose of passing on an inheritance or a family name or some other legal privilege. For example, maybe a wealthy senator would adopt a child of lesser status who had shown extraordinary character, so that that person would then have the status of the senatorial class and the title and opportunity and inheritance that goes with it. And so adoption was usually done to a much older child or even an adult who had somehow proven themselves worthy of the inheritance or privilege. Now, in the New Testament, the concept of adoption is a combination of these factors. Now, in our case, we're not adopted by God because we've proved worthy of the privilege. We were just as needy and unworthy as any orphaned child. Mercy and grace are the cause of our adoption. However, the purpose for our adoption is primarily for our inheritance and for us to enjoy all the privileges and status of belonging to God's family. Adoption in the New Testament is when God brings in people who had no right to be in relationship with Him on their own merits, and because of Christ, He brings us not only into relationship with Himself, but into relationship as sons, with all the legal and personal benefits responsibilities, and privileges. Now, I did not say sons and daughters, and that was on purpose, because in that day, the legal privileges of inheritance and carrying on the family name only went to sons, and every Christian, male and female, shares in those kind of privileges in God's family. Just like every Christian has the female role as the bride of Christ, every Christian has the male role as adopted sons of God. And there are a few places in the New Testament where this word picture is explicitly used. For instance, Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, Paul wrote, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. In this passage, Paul wrote, one of the purposes of Christ's coming was to redeem people from under the law in order that we would receive adoption as sons, 
that is, the full privileges and status as part of God's family. In Ephesians 1.5, it says, He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. And again, we see that a purpose of what God had done in Christ is that we would enjoy adoption as his sons. And this is according to the purpose of his will. And there are other verses that talk about our adoption into God's family, which I've listed for your reference. But let me summarize the idea of adoption. Before we were not part of the people of God, we did not have a solid identity or place in this world. Any identity that we did have in our family or political ties or whatever was fleeting and would never satisfy. We had no genuine hope and no inheritance. But God, in His grace through Christ, brought us not only back to relationship with Him through reconciliation, He went a step further and brought us into full participation in His family. We now have the privilege and inheritance of being sons of God forever in relationship with Him, with all the privileges of the inheritance of Christ. We were a nobody. Now we are an heir of God. That is the word picture of adoption. And then the final word picture that I want to mention is salvation or rescue, which also uses terms like victory. Now, the word picture of rescue is fairly broad, and I could use many illustrations like falling into a river and somebody pulling you out. But I'm going to use the illustration from a battlefield, because that's the illustration that the New Testament most often uses for this concept. This is where an enemy is defeated and people are rescued from the harm that the enemy was attempting to do. You know, imagine you're a soldier or even just an innocent bystander when a war breaks out in your front yard. The bad guy is trying to take over and he wants to harm anyone that stands in his way. And so you're about to be harmed or even killed. But the bad guy does not win. The good army comes and defeats him. And so you're protected and saved from annihilation. So when the New Testament uses this concept, the idea is that some enemy or some form of evil is going to harm you in a variety of ways. But God steps in, in Christ, and defeats the enemy so that you are rescued from any harm the enemy was planning or actually doing. Now, people all the time, uh, for example, those who have been addicted to drugs and set free by Christ, they know the power of the evil that was harming them. But they also know the greater power of God to rescue them out of it. And the New Testament speaks of our rescue in a number of ways. We're rescued from sin, its power and penalty. We're rescued from the devil and all of his schemes. We're rescued from futility and the ways of this world, etc. Salvation and rescue are a large, generic concept that overlaps so many other word pictures that we've seen. But the key emphasis in this idea is the defeat of an enemy. God achieved victory over a variety of enemies that were a danger to us. And so, we receive the benefit of this victory by being rescued from that evil that was trying to do us harm. Let me give you some scripture examples of this concept. Colossians 1.13 says, For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. This passage simply states that Christ has rescued us from the power of darkness, with all that that entails. The dominion of darkness represents all that is evil and opposed to God, and it was exercising control and oppression over all people until Christ defeated the darkness and rescued us from its grip. He has taken us out of that dominion and moved us into his own kingdom and rule. 1 John 3.8 says, The reason the Son of God appeared 
was to destroy the devil's work. Christ, by his death, has destroyed and is destroying the devil and his work. The devil is described as the one with the power of death. So, by destroying the devil, Christ has set us free from the power of death, which is the enemy of all people. Death, obviously, is the opposite of life and works to destroy all life. The devil is the enemy of all that is good and godly, bent on twisting and destroying everything good, and death is one of his tools. But Christ has destroyed the work of the devil by defeating his greatest tool and work. And there are many other verses in the New Testament that talk about victory of Christ over his enemies and ours in order to rescue us, and I've listed some of them for you. To summarize this word picture in terms of its before and after, before we were under the harsh rule of the devil and his evil forces, and the oppression of sin and death and all the world systems that result from them. But Jesus, by his death and resurrection, defeated death, the devil, and all his works. And so, we are freed from all these things that once oppressed us. And we share in the benefits of this victory over evil, which Christ has won. Because of Christ, we experience a change from being a victim of evil to sharing in Christ's victory. All right, these are some of the word pictures the New Testament uses to describe aspects of Christian salvation. And all of these concepts together give us insight into the greatness of all that God has done for us in Christ. Now, by the way, I'm posting a handout on the course website which documents all the information that we've just gone through for your continued reference if you'd like to check it out. But for now, let me try to summarize all these word pictures by the before and after contrasts and what Christ did to make that change. Justification means that we once were guilty and under legal punishment as transgressors of God's rules, but Jesus was punished to pay the legal penalty on our behalf. And so, we are now reckoned as righteous, in right legal standing before God, because the charges against us have been cleared. Redemption means that once we were slaves in captivity and debt because of sin and guilt, but Jesus paid a ransom price of his own death to pay off what we owed. And so, we are now totally freed from that debt that we could not pay, which once had completely bound us. Propitiation means that we once were under the displeasure and wrath of God. But Jesus made a sufficient sacrifice to satisfy and turn away God's wrath from us. And so, we are now no longer under God's wrath, but we experience His favor. He is benevolently disposed towards us. Reconciliation means that we once were in a broken relationship with God, with Him being at enmity with us. But Jesus made peace by taking away the sin and guilt which were the cause of the broken relationship. And so, we are now restored to friendly relations with our Creator and have peace with God. Regeneration means that we once were dead in our sin and guilt, but Jesus miraculously gave us new life through His resurrection power. And so, we are now born again from above with a new spiritual life of the next age, which we did not have before. Adoption means that we once were nobodies, not part of God's family, we had no identity or inheritance, but Jesus brought us into his family by being the firstborn of the new humanity and our mediator, so that now we are heirs. We have the identity and inheritance as the people of God and the new humanity. And finally, salvation and victory means that we once were victims under the oppression of death, the devil, and this evil age, but Jesus rescued us by defeating all these powers, conquering them on the cross. And so, we are now in Christ's victory, free from their power, and we experience the benefits of their defeat as well as their 
coming total annihilation when we will experience the fullness of God's kingdom in the next age. Now, there's so much here, and I hope you're able to take it all in. We should rightly be overwhelmed by the scope of all that God has done for us in Christ. Now, one caution I need to make. Some people see all this as an indication of our value. They conclude that, well, we must be something special for God to do all this for us. However, the New Testament doesn't come at it in that way. Just the opposite. We were totally undeserving of any of this. All these word pictures, they say nothing about our worthiness, but they say everything about God's love and grace and power. All of this does not tell us about ourselves, but it tells us about our Savior. And therefore, I hope this doesn't make us think about ourselves as much as it makes us think more highly of our God. We should focus on who He is, as demonstrated by all that He has done. Our God is great and gracious beyond comprehension, and so our salvation is miraculous and wonderful beyond comprehension. And it changes every part of our life for the better. And so I pray that you will not only understand, but live out the salvation in every part of life. I hope that you will be overcome with gratitude and love and desire to serve your Savior with your whole heart. And I pray that you will live in the freedom, vindication, victory, and new family relationships which Christ has accomplished. And much of the rest of the New Testament is instructions and examples of how to do just that. And now, let's review. There are a few word pictures the New Testament uses to describe salvation. Justification is a picture from a law court. Redemption is a picture from a slave market. Propitiation is the picture from a temple altar. Reconciliation is a picture from personal relationships. Regeneration is the picture from a maternity ward. Adoption is a picture from a family. And salvation and victory is a picture from a battlefield. There are more ways to speak about our salvation in the New Testament. But this covers the, the major ones that are described using these word pictures to elaborate what Christ has accomplished. And I hope this has helped you to understand the New Testament and your own salvation better. And I pray that God uses this to deepen your appreciation and experience of every facet of your salvation, and that He empowers you to live it out more zealously in a way that brings Him glory and blesses the people around you. All right, in the next section, we will move on to Paul's first epistle to the Corinthians. Thanks for watching.